All right. Well, thanks, Dad, <laughs> for <laughs> for being here. Um, th- this is a special podcast episode, um, not only because I have the opportunity to to do this podcast with you, my dad, but because of where we're doing it. So for those who are watching on YouTube, you'll you'll get a sense of kind of where we're at. You can see the mountains um, in the background, um, some trees as well. So we're, we're up in Montana, which has been a family vacation spot for literally generations. And so we thought when we were doing this episode, we said, you know, let's, let's not do it over Zoom or something. Let's, let's do it when we're on vacation. So sorry, Dad, to, 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 to get into your vacation to do a podcast episode, but I'm, I'm appreciative. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, this is into your vacation as well, so it works great. It actually is a remarkable um, opportunity and fun for me to be with you and to be here at our family uh, a cabin that we've had for in generations here in Montana is really special because I think that uh, that my dad, your grandpa, Papa, uh, would be here as well. So yeah. it's exciting to be here. Yeah, and that's part of the reason we we wanted to do it is we were channeling a lot of Stephen Coveys at the moment, <laughs> right? We got. Grandpa, Stephen R. Covey, Stephen M. R. Covey, Stephen H., and even my son is another Stephen <laughs> Covey. So there, there's a lot. There's a lot of us out there. Um, but actually, that's one thing I wanted to, you know, before we get into your book, The Speed of Trust, I wanted to just talk a little bit about, about Papa, which is Stephen R. Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, and, and kind of your relationship with him and, and how that went with the business. So just a brief, brief background for those who don't know, but my grandpa was a university professor for years and years before um, doing anything on, on leadership training. And so he's a university professor. And then when he was around 50, uh, around that time frame, you, you maybe correct me, around 50 years old or so, yep. he started doing leadership training. And it wasn't until in his 50s that he wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It was released in 1989. And then you came into the business around that time. And you were more focused on the business development side of things, not so much thought leadership. So I'm curious, did you, you know, when you came into that, did you always assume you'd just be on the business development side? Did you ever foresee you'd get into the thought leadership side, you know, at the time? Yeah, well, I I came straight out of business school. And so my head was in the business side. And I felt like my main contribution would be to try to um, turn uh, what Papa was doing (laughs) into a true business. And we had other people that were doing great work at that as well. But I felt like I would be on the business side and, and I never saw myself really as a thought leader. And I saw dad as a thought leader, Papa. And, um, but I wanted to, to really build something that could be sustainable and that could leverage and, and could be uh, scalable and we could go worldwide with it and, and do some exciting things. So I really saw myself as coming at this with the idea that, Hey, I've got an understanding of business and I can really help scale this business and leverage it and, and grow it and focus there. So that was really what I thought my value was. And that's what I did for the first uh, 13 years was really focused on the business side. And, and it was exciting because we were able to really do some, some great things and, and scale the business and, and, and grow it and, and also find a business model that would work to keep the company profitable because uh, we were involved with so many <laughs> exciting projects and ideas and things that were tied to the mission, but many of which we couldn't make any money at. And so we called them hobbies, <laughs> which was an exciting thing that was mission oriented, but we couldn't make any money at it. And, and we came to the conclusion at some point that if there was no margin, there was no mission. So we had to learn how to turn this into a business and I felt like that was a contribution that I could make. And I focused my early part of my career exactly on doing that. When you shifted into the thought leadership, you know, when you wrote The Speed of Trust, I have to imagine that you felt, and I know we've talked about this before, but there was some level of imposter syndrome that you must have felt. I mean, I'm sure, 
uh, writing a book after your dad, right? Seven Habits is one of the best selling books, business books of all time. And so what, what was, what was that like for you? You know, being named Stephen Covey, and again, I can relate to this somewhat, (laughs) but being named Stephen Covey and then writing a book, I mean, that's, uh, you know, what was that process like for you and how has it evolved? Yeah. Well, you can totally relate because, because you carry the same name and, and I'm grateful for it just like you are. And, uh, but it was very difficult at first because I felt like, how do you follow Stephen R. Covey and how do you follow seven habits? What am I going to say that would be on par with that? And, and so for, I was dabbling with the thought of wanting to write, but I was scared to death. And, and, um, I just didn't want to be just, um, I didn't want to just write because I had a name. I wanted to write because I had something to say. And it wasn't until I felt that I had something to say, that I found my voice with the ideas around the speed of trust, that suddenly that gave me the confidence that I should do this. But I was almost paralyzed by the fear of, of uh, failing, of not measuring up, not being good enough to follow in the footsteps of seven habits. And, and, um, and it literally almost uh, just uh, mentally, emotionally paralyzed me. Um, but I finally was able to, to break through that and recognize that once I felt I found my voice around trust, now suddenly I felt the courage to write about it. And to take the risk and venture out and not be afraid to fail. And, I, and I, I, I finally came to grips with, I don't have to be my dad. And I don't have to write the seven habits. And I won't. I mean, how are you going to follow the seven habits? But speed of trust could be its own big idea. And, and that gave me confidence. And I, I moved forward from there. So, But that, that was a, a journey at the time. And now I'm, I'm, I'm past it. But at the time, I really was uh, kind of facing that. And, and it took me discovering my voice for me to, to have the courage to do so. So talking about the speed of trust and, and the origin behind it. Um, I was in high school at the time. Right? Yeah, it was right around high school when, when you, were, you were writing it. What, what prompted you to write the speed of trust? Why the topic of trust? Um, I know I've heard you talk about it before, but just wondering if you'd share with with kind of the audience. Yeah. Well, we'd we'd, uh, merged our companies, the old Covey Leadership Center, and with Franklin Quest, a time management company. And these were two great companies, and and, uh, they had good values, good people, uh, good missions, very aligned in so many different ways, and yet completely different approaches to how they did everything. And they'd been arch competitors in the time management space. And, and so now we're merged together. And here we have all these great people. And yet there was low trust. And because I would be in these arch competitors, not because we'd done bad things within the company, this new combined company, but because we saw the world through a whole different lens. Um, and two companies that were arch competitors coming together and there was a not trust. And, and again, we... We, we'd not done things to violate it. We just hadn't earned it and created it together. And I'll never forget the first uh, um, several months and even into a year or so, there was a high cost to low trust that we saw everywhere. Everything got politicized. Everything slowed down. Every decision was questioned. And, and I began to look around and I said, my goodness, um, there's a lack of trust here. And that's politicizing everything and it's costing us to slow down we're, we're not creative we're not innovative we're not collaborative because at, at, at its core there's it's seen through a lens of we they you know the old covey people the old franklin people and not the combined franklin covey company and so we had to really learn how to build that trust but i saw firsthand the high cost of low trust but then we became aware of this conscious of it began to focus on saying, let's, let's build trust. And we began to behave our way into trust through transparency, through talking straight, through listening first and, and showing understanding toward each other. And by behaving our way into greater trust, we actually grew trust. 
And the trust went from low to high. And that changed everything. Now we can do everything faster, less cost, um, greater creativity, greater innovation, passion, commitment, fun. Everything went up. And I kind of just stepped back from this whole experience and I said, I've seen both sides of the equation. I've seen the high cost of low trust and how it literally saps energy from everything. And I've, I've seen the great highs of, of high trust, the, the dividends, the great, the great uh, possibilities that flow when there's high trust. And I've also seen us move from low trust to high trust and how it's learnable, it's movable. And I came out of that saying, we need to talk about this more. People don't get it. We've, we've underestimated trust. It's impacting everything. And I've just witnessed firsthand how low trust is a tax and high trust is a dividend and that you can move the needle on it. You can get better at building trust on purpose. And I felt like while there's some stuff that's out there on trust, most of it is either too academic or too simplistic. Kind of like, you know, just trust everyone. That's just too simplistic. Or too academic and, and not practical. And I felt like there really was an opportunity to show how there is a business case for trust and how trust is learnable and, and how it's really the one thing that changes everything. And that was what kind of prompted that, that whole experience that there needs to be a voice on trust that shows how there's an economic case for it and how trust is learnable as a skill, as a competency. And that's what kind of prompted me to say, I'm going to write a book and, I, and it's going to be called The Speed of Trust. We like to talk about paradigms on this podcast. Would you say though that that is kind of the key paradigm that you walk away from the speed of trust with is that trust is not just some nice, soft social virtue to have, but you can actually make an economic business case. And not only that, but, but it's a learnable skill. Is there, are those kind of the, would you say, the key paradigms from the I, book? Absolutely, son. I think those are the two key paradigms. First, trust is not soft. Rather, it's a hard-edged economic driver. There's a compelling business case for trust. Everyone knows that trust is important socially already. So that's not a paradigm shift. We all know trust matters for relationships and for teams and, and so forth. But most people have never thought about trust in financial terms. But trust always affects the speed at which we can move and the cost of everything. And, and uh, when trust goes down in any relationship, speed goes down and cost goes up. And when trust goes up in any relationship, team, culture, speed goes up, cost goes down. And that is quantifiable. It's economic. You can put a value on it. So that's the first paradigm shift is that trust is a hard-edged financial economic driver, not just a soft social virtue. And then the second one you also identified, and that is the idea that trust is learnable. It's a learnable skill. See, most people start from the premise of you either have trust or you don't. It's either there or it's not. And I'll acknowledge that that's your starting point because we all start with a level, a level of trust, whether it be low, medium, high. But in the same way that you can diminish and lose trust through your behavior, you can also consciously, deliberately create it, grow it, expand it through your behavior. In fact, you can get good at building trust on purpose. So that's the second paradigm shift is that trust is a learnable skill, is a competency. And kind of those two big ideas, that trust is economic and that trust is learnable, is the premise of, of behind the speed of trust. And the way you organize the book, which, which I love, and I think it kind of follows a similar framework to The Seven Habits, is you, you organize it by talking about the five waves of trust starting with self-trust is the first wave. And then the fifth one is societal trust. And it kind of gets to the heart of the inside out approach, which is something Papa always talked about, which I, I feel like is such a key insight to the seven habits is this idea of the inside out approach, which is different from the way a lot of people approach problems and solutions where you know, this idea of having a private victory within your inner self before public victory. And so maybe, uh, yeah, I'm curious if you could maybe talk a little bit about why the inside 
out approach matters. And then may- maybe a brief overview of the five, five waves of trust. But I just wanted to highlight that it starts from the inside out, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this does flow out of seven habits thinking. And, you know, private victories precede public victories. And you start, you want to build trust with others, build trust first with yourself. And, and uh, you want to build trust on a team, build trust in relationships and so forth. Inside out is really the only sustainable way to influence people and, and, uh, and to have it be sustainable. And so the idea of the five waves of trust is very much the inside out process. And so the idea, so, you know, five waves means the idea of the ripple effect where the drop of water comes down. And then the ripples, the waves, they start at the inside and they ripple out. And the very first wave is self-trust. Do I trust myself? Do I give to my team a leader, a teammate that they can trust? Is it smart to trust me? Think about it. How are we going to build trust with others if we don't trust ourselves? It's got to be inside out. So self-trust is the first wave. And then it ripples out the second wave, which is relationship trust. Building that trust one-on-one. It then ripples out to the next wave, which is team or organizational trust. And depending upon my vantage point, if I'm the leader of a team, my organization is my team. If I'm the president of the company, it's my company. Whatever my vantage point is, my organization, I build it at that level. That's the third wave. Then the fourth wave is now market trust or stakeholder trust. It's trust with customers and partners. And then I ripple out from there to all of society. So five waves of trust. And the thing about trust is if I want to diagnose or, or assess, I can start at the outside and, and move in. Outside in is a great way to diagnose or assess something. But if I want to change, develop, or transform trust, it has to be inside out. We need to look in the mirror, each of us. Do I trust myself and work on that self-trust? Do I give to my team? a teammate that they can trust and then ripple out from there. Then it becomes natural and abundant to build trust that way. But look at it this way. If I'm in an organization and um, imagine it would be incongruent to tell your people who you don't trust to go out and build trust with customers. You know, that's just incongruent, but it's natural and abundant to tell people who you trust to go out and build trust with customers inside out is the most sustainable, most leveraged, most enduring approach to how you build trust. It's really, but not just trust, but how you affect change in all of life. And I learned that from, from uh, my dad, Papa. And, and I, I find it, it's just a, it's a different way of thinking than I think uh, when, when people approach problems or, or even opportunities, you know, if you, take trust, for example, and you're in an organization and you have a team or a company and you say, you know, you see the problem that there's low trust. I don't think the natural reaction for most people is to go inside out. It's not. It's, it's probably, you know, to say, okay, well, what, you know, what can we do? You know, the problem's out there. But like Papa used to say that that thought is the very problem, right? Exactly. That's, that's the very problem is, is rather the thinking. than, yeah, the thinking, rather than have that approach, you start in the inside and that's, it's just, it's different. It's something that even me, you know, growing up with, with Papa, it's something in the last few years of my life that I've tried, I've been trying to change that mindset, that, that paradigm on approaching, you know, problems I see from the inside out approach rather than say, okay, if I want to work on my marriage, for example, and do better, it's not, you know, focus on the other person. It's not, not my spouse, (laughs) not, not Emily, but it's, it's more, it starts with me actually. Right. Right. So it's a, it's just, it's different. Maybe, maybe that's the ultimate paradigm shift is that it's inside out, not outside in because human nature is that they need to change as soon as they do this, then we can do that. You know, then we can move forward and we, we've got to go inside out. And that is the ultimate paradigm shift. I'll give you an example of this. One time I gave a presentation on, on speed of trust. I went through the five waves and then we took a break at the break. Someone came up to me and said, Hey, can I talk to you for a minute? And he said, 
what you just went through with this five waves of trust, this inside out approach is really helpful to me because it helps explain my prop, my, where I'm at in my life. And then he kind of opened up and he said, look, I'm not happy with my life. It's not turned out the way I've wanted. Um, I've had problems at work and I've bounced around to different jobs, always blaming my boss. You know, my, my very first company can't trust my boss. So I get a new boss, can't trust this boss. So I leave the company, go to a new company, can't trust management there, can't trust my boss there, can't trust my boss. And I went through boss after boss, company after company, never trusting any of them. Because, but then I look around in my, in my personal life and I come home and I don't trust my neighbors and I don't trust my school and I don't trust my, um, he goes, I don't even trust some of my kids. And, and then he goes, then I realized when you went through the five ways of trust, I realized what my problem is. And then he looked around to make sure no one was looking and he whispered into my ears and he said these words, I don't trust myself. I don't trust myself. And I realize now that I'm projecting that distrust of myself out onto everybody else and viewing them as not trustworthy. He goes, so, you know, what do I do? And, and, um, and I said, well, it's a really, um, you know, good observation to recognize this because if you don't trust yourself, you can't trust others. And then I kind of walked through a process of how to gain that self-trust by learning to make and keep commitments to yourself and small things could help you do it. The main point was that um, if you go outside in, which this guy had done his whole life, always seeing the problem being out there, everybody else, then, then you can't influence your world. And you'll, you'll always have reasons why you can't trust anybody, why they're not trustworthy. And you'll always have, you know, excuses, blaming, finger pointing. But the real impact, the real influence is to, to look in the mirror and to go inside out. And it, in it, this person's world was turned upside down, as I learned afterwards with what he did, and how it changed his life. It's got to be inside out. There's never a more applicable way of thinking about this than through the lens of trust. So with that, let's start on the first wave. We won't, we won't go in depth on all the waves, but I think maybe focusing on the first two would be helpful for this, this particular paradigm. Um, so, so with that, so self-trust, you say that when it comes to trust, there's both character and competence, and then there's kind of four core competencies around those two. So maybe talking about that first wave, self-trust, character, competence, and how the four cores tie into that. Yeah. So character and competence are kind of the foundational construct. And then I just kind of go one level down and say there's four cores of credibility. Two belong to character. And two belong to competence. So if you think about it, the four cores are kind of, a, they're a deeper dive into the character and competence construct. So I use a metaphor of a tree. You have the roots and the trunk of the tree. So that's flown out of your character. Then you have the branches and the fruits of the tree. And that's flown out of your competence. And those four cores of credibility flow in that way. The roots, the trunk, the branches, and the fruits. So the, the first core of credibility that flows out of your character is integrity. It's the roots of the tree. And it is what we think it is. Honesty, truthfulness, doing the right thing. It takes humility to have character. It also takes courage. Because if you think about it, it's relatively easy to do the right thing when there's no cost to it. The test of integrity is when there's a cost or a consequence. Do I still do the right thing? So that's the roots, integrity. And then intent is the trunk. It also flows from my character. Intent is my motive and my agenda. The motive that best builds credibility and trust is genuine caring. Do I care about the people that I'm working with and leading? And do they know I care? Do I care about my clients? Do I care about my family? Do I, caring is the motive. The agenda that best builds credibility and trust is when you seek mutual benefit. We call that win-win, right? So, I'm seeking the interest of others, not just my own. Yes, I want my own too, but I also want their, them to win. Mutual benefit, win-win. That's all part of intent. And when people see that we care and are seeking their interests, they tend to trust us. If they don't, if they don't think that we care or not seeking their interest as well as our own, they tend not to trust us. If they see us as self-serving, they won't trust us. 
So integrity and intent is the starting point, the first core, two cores of credibility, flowing from our character. Then the upper half of the tree is the competence half. And the third core is the branches. That's our capabilities. By capabilities, I mean our talents, our expertise, our knowledge, our skills. Um, and the key question here is this, are we relevant? Are we learning, growing, improving, getting better, staying relevant, especially in a changing world? So we kind of, we got to constantly be learning and, and recreating ourselves, reinventing ourselves, staying relevant because that keeps us credible, which keeps us trusted. And so those branches then produce the fruits and the fourth core of credibility are the fruits. And that's the root, the fruits of the tree, which I call results. It's our performance, our current performance, our past performance. And that matters because people tend to project upon us future performance based upon what they've seen. When they see a track record of results, it gives them confidence. If there's a gap in those results, if they're spotty or inconsistent, in other words, if there's no fruit on the tree or the fruit is rotten, there'll be a gap in that confidence. So that's four cores of credibility, integrity and intent flowing from our character, capabilities and results flowing from our competence. And what I find is that little framework, it's simple, is so useful to assess trust situations. Because I can't tell you how many times I've had people come up to me and say, Stephen, I just don't quite trust the person and I can't pinpoint why. The four cores of credibility help you pinpoint why. Because it's one thing if there's low trust, say, because of a lack of integrity, that's one kind of issue. But what if there's low trust because there's a lack of results? They're, they don't perform, they don't deliver. Or low trust because their intent is entirely self-serving or low trust because their capabilities have fallen behind and they're not current, they're not relevant. These are all different issues. And those four cores help, help us assess trust situations and diagnose, but also more importantly, help us know what to do about it, to know how to, you know, how to be prescriptive about what to work on. And that's true for others, but it's especially true for ourselves. To always look in the mirror and ask, how credible am I? as a leader, as a colleague, as a contributor, whatever my role might be, and look at credibility through the lens of those four dimensions. Then you'll kind of know where to start and what to work on because all four are vital to be at, a, at least a threshold level. That's the idea is that self-trust emerges from our character and our competence, which could be further defined as those four cores of credibility. And I wanted to ask you a question in relation to that, the first wave. Um, is it possible to fake trust? Um, and the reason I ask this, I've always been fascinated by something Papa said, where he talked about, you know, it's, it's, it would be impossible to fake proficiency in something like, like the game of tennis or golf, for example, right? So if you're a tennis player, there's a very clear path from going from level one to level 10. If you're at a level two, you can't play with someone at a level 10. You can't fake that, yeah. right? But when it comes to character and uh, emotional development, sometimes it feels like people can fake that. What, you know, I, I, so I wanted to ask in, in the context of trust, I mean, can you, can you fake trust or is it just a temporary thing you get away with? Um, you, you, it's a temporary thing at best. You, I've seen some people fake it for a while, but they can't sustain it. And at some point it will come out, the, the disingenuousness, the lack of credibility at some point will be manifest. But can you fake it for a while? You can, because it's a social system. You know, there's the natural systems and social systems. Like the law of the harvest is a natural system. You can't fake planting and growing seeds on the farm. You got to actually do the work. But people can get away with things for a while in a social system, but you can't sustain it. But look at it this way. Think of, of, um, of a con man. A con man is short for confidence man. Confidence is another word for trust. So a con man is someone who earns your trust in order to deceive you and defraud you later. But they, in the short term, do things to kind of earn your trust and then once they get that trust, then they deceive you, but they can't sustain it. See, cause it's just temporary. It's a, it's an artificial, um, you know, creation of trust that is not sustainable in any prolonged circumstance. 
And, and so you can't fake it in the long run. You can't, maybe someone does it for a while. It's just not sustainable. It will get manifest at some point, put, put it under stress, under pressure, play it out over time. And people will see that this person is not credible. They're not trustworthy. And, and uh, the trust will go down. It's kind of like, you know, back to the tennis or golf example. I've gone out before in golf. I'm not very good. I've gone out and I've had a good first hole <laughs> where they say, wow, you're pretty good. Play with me three or four holes and you'll quickly see that I'm not. And the same thing with trash. Maybe I could fake it for a hole or two, but you can't sustain it over 18 holes because it'll be manifest that, that you're just not at that level. And it's, it's trust will also be manifest when, when you don't have the credibility. I don't know, Dad. It, you know, <laughs> so, sometimes you could be on fire with the golf game. Well, I remember the last time we played, your drive was just on point. So, Right, but we only played a few holes, yeah, remember? Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. That's, so, that's true. why I say, let's play 18, son, and you'll see. You'll remember. You've seen me play 18, and I fell apart at some point. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Um, so talking about the second wave now, second wave of trust, which is relationship trust. And this is something I feel is so applicable from the book, right? That that people walk away from reading the book or going through a training on the speed of trust and you have these 13 behaviors. And what I love about it is that it's it's so applicable to life, right? Because you can you can walk away from reading the book or, or going through a training or, or listening to you talk about it and you can actually take just one of these behaviors and actually apply it and, and that's where you you can get better at trust, right? So maybe talk. So, so there's the 13 behaviors. There's, there's some that are based on the character side and then some that's based on the competence. And then I think there's three that are kind of combined, right? Character, character competence. Right. right. Yeah, these behaviors are just practical, tangible actions that people put into practice. Talk straight, demonstrate respect, create transparency, right wrongs, show loyalty. See, those are what I call the character behaviors. Just simple two-word expressions, and you kind of get it instantly. Um, like example, talk straight simply means that we tell the truth. You call things what they are. Use simple language. Now, the opposite of talking straight is when people lie. And people have learned that if someone lies, they might get away with it for a while. That's the fake trust. Can you fake trust? They might get away with it for a while, but they can't sustain it. At some point, they'll run out of runway. And most people know that. And so they've learned lying doesn't work. So our biggest challenge to talking straight is not the opposite, the lying. I think it tends to be what I call the counterfeit behavior. Counterfeit behavior is kind of like counterfeit money that looks real, but it's not. Counterfeit behavior looks real, might even work for a while. But over time, um, you'll be seen for what it is, which is a, a artificial manipulation. And so the counterfeit behavior to talking straight is when people spin or when they twist or manipulate or posture. It's when they, quote, technically tell the truth, but leave the wrong impression. It's when you tell people what they want to hear and you sugarcoat everything and really hype it up or, you know, or exaggerate excessively. I'm not against being optimistic, but, you know, someone could really spin, make something sound different or better than it, than it really is. And that's what causes people to really lose trust. And so I think our biggest challenge tends to be less the opposite of the behavior and more the counterfeit is less the line and more the spin and tell telling people what they want to hear. And, and uh, so I use that just one illustration of, you know, taking one of the behaviors, talk straight, the next five flow out of your competence. So it's deliver results, get better, meaning continuously improve, confront reality, clarify expectations, practice accountability. And accountability is so important. Sometimes people say, Hey, are you going to trust me? Or are you going to hold me accountable? As if they were two different things. And it's no, really what enables us to build smart trust and sustain it is when we've agreed to a process of accountability to the trust being given. So that's a great way of building that trust. And the opposite is when people say, hey, don't blame me, not my fault. And the counterfeit of accountability is when people point the finger and say it's his fault, her fault, their fault. They play the blame game. So practice accountability is a vital behavior that builds trust. And the last three flow from that combined character and competence. They, they flow equally from both camps. 
listen first. And Papa and Seven Habits called that seek first to understand, then to be understood. Keep commitments. You do what you say you're going to do and then extend trust. You got to give it to get it. And so those are 13 behaviors. And I've had people say, oh, 13, that's too many. I can't remember 13. And initially when I was working on this, this is what the data was showing. It was what the practice was showing that all these were vital. And every time I tried to condense it from 13 down to seven, the magic number, right? Or to five, I lost too much in the translation. They became too esoteric. The strength of the 13 is they are so specific, so practical, so actionable. You know, create transparency, openness, light I can see through, right wrongs. You make it right when you're wrong. Show loyalty. You speak about people as if they were present. All high leverage behaviors that will build trust faster or destroy trust faster. So that's the strength. And what I like to say to people is don't worry about focusing on all 13 all at once because that can be overwhelming. But pick three to work on at any given time as part of an ongoing action plan to get better. To, you know, pick three or even just pick one of those behaviors to work on. And then to, and to work on that and then, then move to another and to another. But the 13 behaviors are really practical, tangible ways that you can behave your way into trust, just like you can behave your way out of it. They're high leveraged. They're disproportionate in building trust or destroying trust. They'll do it faster than anything else imaginable to build it or to, or to destroy it. So that's the idea behind the behaviors is that trust is learnable, both through your credibility, which is those four cores of, of credibility, and through your behavior. And we've identified the 13 high leverage behaviors that will build or destroy trust faster than anything else. And one practical example I want to share with that is one of the behaviors on both the character and competence side is keeping commitments, like you said. And I've been in, I've been in sales for most of my career. And just, and this is just a small example, but I I think it kind of illustrates the point when, when you meet with someone, you know, from a sales role and you, you know, have a meeting with someone, a lot of times it's, okay, I'm going to commit to send you this follow-up information, this data, this white paper that, you know, so-and-so. And it's, it's such a simple thing, but you create a commitment with, with the client and you're saying, I'm going to commit to you that by tomorrow I, I'll get you that information, right? And it was interesting because recently I had an example of, of a client where um, we had a meeting. There were some other people involved who hadn't met me before. And the client said to me, all right, well, Stephen will get us that because I know Stephen always keeps his, he keeps his commitments. And it was just kind of a, it was an instant where I was like, okay, that's, that's a real life example of actually building trust. You know, again, that's from a sales role perspective, but I kept a commitment and it was just, it was really only three times it happened where I met with them. I promised him I'd send something. And then I would say in an email, you know, hey, as as promised, as discussed, here's here's the data and the information. But doing that three times and then having a meeting and then someone else involved, you know, that didn't know me or didn't trust me. But the one person said, Stephen's good for the commitment because he'll do it. Right. So just just a real a real live example of um, where, where in the moment I said, hey, dad would I said, dad would love this as an example. So <laughs> it's a great example of, of uh, making and keeping commitments as a way of building trust fast and also of the speed of trust in action, because now your one customer, your client is telling a prospect that they can trust you because they because you do what you say you're going to do and you don't make a commitment that you're not going to keep. And sometimes people kind of throw out commitments too loosey goosey and they over promise and under deliver thinking, well, the grand promise will help me get the deal. But then they only partly deliver on it. The next time they make a promise, people don't fully believe. Whereas the example you just gave, if you make a commitment, you keep it at all, all, almost at all costs, or at least communicate when you can't. And, and um, what that does is it tells people that you are careful about commitments and if you make it, you will keep it. And there is a, that becomes part of your reputation, part of your brand. It's credibility. You build trust exceptionally fast because it's known you will do what you say you're going to do. And um, that's a great illustration. You know, I give the example in the Speed of Trust book of Warren Buffett doing a deal with Grady Rogier from uh, when he bought McLean, this big food services company. The whole deal happens. 
on a simple handshake after one meeting of two hours and 29 days later, they had their money. $23 billion company, huge deal. This would normally take six months to a year with investment bankers, attorneys, accountants, verifying the data. But the whole deal happens on a handshake, closes in less than a month. I talked to Grady Rogier. He was the CEO of McLean. He told me personally, he said, look, I'd build a reputation that I would do what I would say, what I said I was going to do. And, and that we, you know, we were, we were straightforward. We had this reputation. Warren knew that. He saw that. And so it enables Buffett to come in. He's got confidence that these financials are accurate, that they are what they say they are, that, that, that Grady Rozier will do what he says he's going to do. And with that, you build trust exceptionally fast. You do a deal on a handshake with no due diligence. Speed of trust. So just a very simple illustration of how one behavior, making and keeping commitments, will build trust exceptionally fast for anyone. And that's a practical thing that people can do in any new relationship. Try to find a commitment you can make that would be value adding to the person and then make one and keep it and then make another and keep it. Always try to add value by making and keeping commitments and you'll build trust exceptionally fast that way. So one other, a couple more things I want to ask and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up here. So what do you say to the person who has trusted before and then they've been burned. I'm sure, and I know you've told me that it's something that will come up is you'll see someone in the audience where very clearly they're having a hard time with, oh, you know, let's just trust everyone. And this is, you know, let's go down that route and everything's great. Everyone has trust. So what, what do you say to those people? You know, how, how do you approach those people who have been yeah, burned? What, what's your approach? Well, um, I understand that because I've also been burned in my life. I think we all have. And so I acknowledge this. There is a risk in trusting people. There is. And there's also a risk in not trusting people. And I think that oftentimes not trusting can be the greater risk. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to be smart about it. I call it smart trust. And so we go into a situation where we try to assess, uh, you know, the situation. What Am I extending trust on? Am I extending trust on, you know, in, in the example you gave of, should I, you know, sales example, should I give the business to this company, to this salesperson? Should I give them the business? Can I trust them? Will they deliver? Or it might be, I have a project. Do I turn the project over to this person to lead the team? Or do I extend trust to, you know, to these people? Right now, people are in the pandemic and its aftermath. People are working a lot of times from home. Do I trust my people? You know, what am I extending trust on? What's the risk involved? You're assessing that. And what's the credibility of the person and the people involved? So you're trying to kind of do some good analysis and judgment. But what I've learned is that, is that the analysis of kind of assessing the situation, the risk, and the credibility of the person is important. But what's more important is first to start with the propensity to trust the willingness, the bias, the desire to trust. So if you start with the propensity to trust, which is I'd like to trust, because if I can trust, it's a better way to approach life and business and relationships. That comes from my heart. But then I balance it with my head and I assess the situation, the risk, the credibility of the people. If there's really high risk, then I'm going to be a little bit more careful, more cautious about how much trust I give. And if there's really low credibility or unproven credibility, I'm going to be a little bit more careful, more cautious, and, and not just extending abundant trust to anyone and everyone with high-risk situations, and they're not ready for it, because that could be, you know, that, that could risk too much. So it's just not a one-size-fits-all. It's good judgment. And it's balancing your propensity to trust that flows from your heart with your analysis that flows from your head. And so what I would say to the person that's been burned is I understand um, there's a risk to trust. There's also a risk not to trust. You got to decide which is the greater risk and how can you mitigate the risk? How can you lessen the risk by being smart about it, by extending, by, by, by creating clear expectations and agreed upon process for accountability? And if the risk is really high, maybe you only give a little bit of trust in that situation until the risk lessens. Or maybe you develop their capabilities and their competence 
until you feel like they are so capable now, they're ready to be trusted abundantly. So it's not a one size fits all where you just trust anyone and everyone the same way. It's good judgment, good judgment, smart trust, assessing the situation, the risk, the credibility. But I have a bias to make sure that, that we lead out with the mindset of, I want to trust people. There's that, that expression that everyone likes to quote, trust, but verify. I like it. And I don't, I like it in this sense that, 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 uh, the idea that you, you want to trust, but you also need to verify, meaning you have to assess the situation, the risk, the credibility, but too often for people trust, but verify really means verify, 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 and never trust. And, and uh, there might be a time if the risk is so great that that's the right thing to do, like on a nuclear submarine, <laughs> you're going to be really careful because the risk is so great. But um, I prefer, you know, the idea of trust and verify because the button negates everything in front of it. So you're assessing the situation, the risk, the credibility. You're finding a smart way to extend trust to people. So smart trust will help us kind of navigate these, this situation of when to trust, when not to trust, how much. But again, I have a strong bias. Make sure we start with the, with the propensity to trust and then balance it by the analysis, not the other way around. Because then we'll find all kinds of possibilities to create and extend more trust than we might have thought was possible. And last question as it relates to, to speed of trust. Um, is it possible to restore trust? And I think you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> so... Uh, it, this is somewhat of an embarrassing story to tell, but you've published it in front of the world, so everyone already knows about it. So, so maybe let me let me share let me share maybe my side of the story. Okay. Um, so, something my dad wrote about in the Speed of Trust was a story of his teenage son who had just gotten his driver's license, who got a reckless driving speeding ticket, um, and basically had to go through the process of restoring trust. So that teenage son was indeed me. It was it was me. So let me give maybe just a little background to it. So I just turned 16. And, and it's so bad. It sounds so bad when I tell it. Because it is. It is just awful. So I was 16 years old. Just got my license. Only had it for a couple weeks. One of the things we did up front is we established kind of a, an agreement or a, a contract together. You know, say, hey, when you get this license, and this was separate from any, you know, legal or state thing, it was between me and my parents. So you have, you have this agreement, and there was a few things in it. And, you know, one of it was, you know, if you break the law, if you do this, there's, there, will, there will be consequences, right? But, you know, at the time, I just wanted my license. So I just signed the thing. It's like, whatever, you know, this is so weird that you're making me do some weird <laughs> yeah. commitment thing. So anyways, we do it and something, and, and this is the embarrassing part. So something my friends did that were older and had their license is we would go out at, you know, 11 at night, you know, 12 a.m. And we go on this road where, you know, no one was out. So in our minds, it was, you know, we weren't being stupid. It was, you know, it was okay to do this because no one was out. But we would go on this this road. It was a uh, 25 mile an hour speed limit. And we would just basically go as fast as we could on the road, right? And at the time, you know, 16 years old, you just don't think and process through everything. And so I thought that was fun to do. So I was excited to get my license and be able to do a, a similar thing, thinking, okay, it's late at night. No one's going to know. No one's out. We're not going to hurt anyone, that type of thing. Well, anyways, uh, sure enough, the first time I did it, a couple weeks after I got my license, I was with some friends in the car and was just kind of trying to show off and say, oh, this is this is fun. So I was going really fast down this road. I was <laughs> going 82 and a 25 is the exact, uh, uh, which is literally like a reckless driving ticket. And of course, I got pulled over. There was a cop, uh, pulled me over and instantly in my heart, my heart just sank. And I was just like, my life is over. It's ruined. And then the, the, the police officer called, uh, you and mom, and I'm sure that was a, <laughs> a great call to get at, you know, 1145 at night or uh. whenever it was. And I remember you coming on, on the scene and just, just pure, just disappointment. I could see the anger too, but but you kind of masked it well, where it was just more you're showing the disappointment. So anyways, long story short, um, I did not get my license revoked from the state, which uh, was surprising. I probably should have. 
But I did get my license revoked from you and mom <laughs> because of the agreement we had set up before. And at the time, being 16 and just getting my license, it was just devastating, right? I just felt like the end of the world. Um, but I had made that agreement. We had made that agreement together. And at the time, I didn't think of it in this sense as the way you tell it in the book. But over the ensuing months, I was able to restore the trust and I was able to, I, I feel like I was able to change my behavior when it came to driving. And I actually had a, um, uh, a lot of the parents and, and my friends kind of saw me as a great driver as time went on. I was able mm-hmm. to restore it. So I wanted to share my side. Maybe, maybe <laughs> you, you had some of the insights of how, you know, how you can restore trust, but, but anyways, it's an embarrassing story. I don't like to tell it, but you told it publicly in front of millions. So, you know, we'll just, we'll just go with it. So, (laughs) well, thanks son. And, and remember though, before I told it, before I wrote about it, I asked you, yeah, but I was like 16. I was like a, you know, a teenager or something. I know, I I know, but I still asked you, I said, no, I'm just, how do you feel about it? No, I'm just kidding. I'm I'm happy. It's, I'm happy. It's a good illustrative story. And I think people can relate. They can relate to it because we can all relate to it. We all made that type of mistake in our life and some, or or it's equivalent. We've all fallen short. I have too. And, uh, absolutely. But, um, the great thing is the main point of the story is that it's possible to restore trust even when it's been violated, if you're willing to behave your way back into it. And that's what I learned from, um, from my dad, your grandpa, that you can't talk your way out of a problem that you behaved your way into. You can't talk your way back into it. But I like to add, no, you can't, but you can behave your way back into it. And that's what you did, is you literally took responsibility after that and said, I realize I've got to kind of change how I'm seen as a driver and I've got to be responsible and, and drive well and be safe. And, and, and you gain that reputation with your friends, with their parents, and you behave your way back into trust to where the trust actually became higher than it was ever before. And that's the, the key insight is that it's possible in most situations to restore trust. It's not easy, but if you're willing to behave your way back into it, you can restore the trust. And, and that's, in, that's important in a low trust world. We all fall short. We all make mistakes. We all blow it at different times. And, and, um, and if we're willing to take responsibility, to own it, to make it right as best we can, you know, the right and the wrong where possible, to then kind of create new expectations of what we're going to do to regain, reestablish that trust, you know, clarify expectations. And then if we now do what we just said we're going to do, and that's what you did. You said, look, I'm going to be safe. And I, and I want to, I want to show you, I can be a safe driver and you can count on me and rely upon me. You can trust me. And then you demonstrated it. You said you were going to do it. You demonstrated it. you did what you say you're going to do. You kept the commitments. And what happened is you behaved your way back into trust and the trust came back and went even higher. And that's exciting because the equivalent of that can happen for all of us. If we, if we couldn't restore trust in our world today, we'd all be circling the drain because it's a low trust world. And uh, so this is hopeful for all of us that, that it's, if we're willing to work at it and behave our way back into it, we can restore trust in most situations. I say most because it takes two to restore it. And someone might not give you a chance to restore trust. That's why it's never a good strategy to say, hey, if I lose trust, I'll just regain it because you might not get a chance to. In our situation, you know, I gave you a chance to and you wanted to take that chance and you wanted to restore it. And, and, uh, and it wasn't, um, you know, such an egregious violation. It was just a circumstantial situation. Um, whereas there might be other situations where the violation is so egregious, you don't have a chance. You know, Bernie Madoff, were he alive today, would have had a hard time restoring trust because he violated people's trust so egregiously over years. That would be hard to restore. Certainly, it would be hard to restore fast. But it's, it's optimistic. It's hopeful. The trust is restorable in most situations. And you're Exhibit A. So I appreciate you giving me permission to share that story. And I remember that one time we were with that client and I told you were in the room and I told the story. And, uh, and, and 
it was I can I know that's a it's a little bit both embarrassing, but it's also a great illustration of uh, how trust is learnable. So the most important thing is to recognize where you ended up right. in a great place, right. like you are now. Well, and I'll say that I don't I don't think I've gotten a speeding ticket <laughs> since then because it, it is ingrained in my mind that experience was so traumatic. But it, but it was true. I really um, and again I wasn't thinking in terms of frameworks and trust at the time, right? I, nope. But it was more that I I wanted to drive again, and the only way I was going to be able to do that is I had to I had to restore the trust with you and mom first, and then. And then uh, it extended to my friends and my friends' parents that, you know, I was a responsible driver. So, so it is, it's a great story. You can still use it. That's fine. Thanks, son. Yeah. <laughs> so last thing, before I ask the final two questions, yeah. I ask everyone, you have a new book coming out next year. Yeah. I've seen you work so hard at this thing. Um, I can't ever imagine writing a book myself because it looks just, yeah, it's, it, it's a lot of work. I've seen you put in the time. But you have this book coming out next year, March of 2022, and it's called Trust and Inspire. So maybe give give the audience a brief uh, preview yeah. of, of what you have in mind for that book. What, what, is, what is the premise, what it's about? Yeah, the basic premise is this, is that the world has changed, but our style of leadership has not. <laughs> We're still kind of leading in the same way that we've been leading for years. We've just become better at it more sophisticated, more enlightened. I call it kind of command and control is the old way to lead. And, and, um, and maybe our old model of command and control is more authoritarian command and control. And what's happened over time is we've become more sophisticated to where it's now an enlightened command and control. But our paradigm, which is what this podcast is all about, our paradigm hasn't shifted towards how we see people and how we see leadership. The idea that there is greatness inside of people. And our job as a leader is to unleash their greatness, their potential, not to try to control them. And that people are whole people, body, heart, mind, spirit. So our job as a leader is to inspire them, not merely motivate through carrot and stick. And the idea that, that, um, um, you know, that leadership is stewardship. So our job as a leader is, is to elevate uh, caring uh, and service above self-interest and, and that there's enough for everyone. So our job as a leader is to elevate caring above competing. And then finally, the idea that, that uh, what we talked about in this podcast, that enduring influence is created from the inside out. So our job as a leader is to go first Collectively, those fundamental beliefs comprise a paradigm of how we see people, how we see leadership. And we need to shift that paradigm to this more holistic, complete one. And then it will naturally follow that we lead in a new way. And I call it trust and inspire as opposed to command and control or even an enlightened command and control. Trust and inspire. And it has three basic premises, three stewardships. They are very simple. You model, you trust, and you inspire. So you model the behavior. You're the example, the model, you go first. You trust, you trust people, you extend trust to people as a way of leading, a way of operating. You find the smart trust way to be trusting of people because of what it does to them, how it brings out the best in them. And then you inspire others. And that's a paradigm shift that, because most people think, hey, you gotta be charismatic to inspire. And I say, no, everyone can inspire. Inspiring is a learnable skill. You inspire others when you model for them. You inspire others when you trust them. And you inspire others when you connect with people. When you connect with them through caring and belonging. And also when you connect people to purpose, to meaning, to contribution. So you can learn to inspire. And, and this is kind of a leadership. Trust and inspire is what's needed in a new world with all these changes around us in technology, in changes in the workforce, in the workplace, in the, in, in, uh, the diversity, the, the need for inclusion, all these things. People don't want to be managed. They want to be led. They want to be trusted. They want to be inspired. We need a new way of leading in a new world. And you can't just incrementally improve the old paradigm and become more enlightened in our command and control. No, we needed to cross the chasm into a whole new way of thinking, a new paradigm, 
trust and inspire. It's a better way to lead. It's a better way to live in this new world. That's the idea behind it. Well, that's exciting. We're going to look forward to that for sure. So two final questions that I, I ask every, every author who comes on the podcast. The first one, we, we've kind of covered this a little bit, but what's, what is one practical action step a listener could take to get better at trust? I would say this. I'm going to focus on the 13th behavior, which is extend trust. You got to give trust to get trust. Too often people say, hey, I'll trust them when they prove I can trust them. Well, you know what? In today's world, that might take too long. It's a better starting point to say, I start with trust in most situations until proven otherwise. Certainly with my colleagues and my peers, because we've been hired by the same company. So it's better to have a starting point of, I trust you until you prove that I shouldn't. Instead of, I don't trust you until you prove to me that I should. It just takes too long. So be the first to extend trust. Do it in a smart way. I'm not saying blindly trust anyone and everyone, but find the ways to lead out in extending trust to other people. Because if you are trusting, you'll generate a reciprocity. People will trust you back. So you want to build trust? First, be trustworthy, yes, but then also be trusting. Give it to get it. Extend it to receive it. And people will be inspired by it. They'll rise to the occasion, they'll perform better, and they will give it back to you. And you can create a virtuous upward spiral of trust and confidence, creating more trust and confidence, and everyone feeling inspired by it. And so it's just it's simple. And, you know, uh, not only be trustworthy, be trusting. Not blindly, but in a smart way. But it just ignites people their potential, their talent, their creativity, and it generates a reciprocity of trust. It comes back to you. You build it fast by being trusting. That's great. Thanks, Tad. Uh, last, last question. Um, pretend or imagine you were sitting one-on-one -on -one with someone who was just starting off in their career, and they asked you about success, both in terms of what is success and how to be successful. How, how would you respond to that individual? Here's three thoughts I have. First, focus on the primary success over secondary success. Or uh, as Papa used to say, your grandfather, my dad, primary greatness over secondary greatness. So secondary greatness, secondary success is, you know, accomplishments, achievements, awards, accolades, uh, wealth, prestige, all the things that follow from that. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. That's a good thing, but it's secondary. What's more important and more foundational is the primary success, which is the development of character, of integrity, of, of uh, fairness, of abundance, of compassion, of empathy, of understanding, of being a good person. And, and if you start with the primary success, as your primary, as your principal driver, your starting point, in many situations, you'll also end up with secondary success. You may not, but even if you didn't, that's a greater success to be a person of character, to be a person of integrity, whose word is their bond, to be a loving person, a caring person, a compassionate person. That'd be more important to have that than to have accolades and not to be a person of integrity or not to care about other people. So there is a hierarchy and primary success in the long run is more significant than secondary success. Primary greatness precedes secondary greatness. So that'd be the first thought is focus on being a good person and serving and contributing. Second, I'm reminded of Clayton Christensen, the Harvard Business School professor that just passed away who said, the only metrics in my life that will truly matter are the people who I have helped one by one to become better, a better person. So he literally measured success for him by how many people he was able to help one by one. So it's really not even how many, but just by the people he was able to help one by one become better. And that suddenly changes the equation from, I'm just trying to change the whole world to, 
if I can just help one person and then another person, then another person, one by one, to become better, to improve the quality of their life, that is a measure of success. That's remarkable because it takes success from the abstract of changing the world, which is a nice thing, to what if I could change, help change the life of one person? And you know what? Clayton Christensen did that one by one because he did it with me one by one. And you know what? He changed the world <laughs> with his thinking around disruptive technologies. So he did change the world, but his metric of success was helping a person, one person at a time. That's really inspiring to me. And then finally, what I would say is the third thought is what, um, again, I learned from dad. And that is that life is about contribution, not accumulation. So this is somewhat reminiscent of the first idea of primary greatness preceding secondary greatness. But the whole idea of it to be a value, to contribute, to have a purpose, to create meaning, um, to leave a legacy, to matter, to make a difference. That's more important than just accumulating either wealth or prestige or, or status or what have you. And again, that can happen too, but life in the end is really about significance. It is about contribution. It is about making a difference and mattering. And, and um, it's hard to have that in mind when you're just starting because you're going from, you know, survival to stability to success. But there's something beyond success, which is significance. That's true success. And that's contribution. That's adding value. That's making a difference as opposed to just achieving for yourself. And so that's the whole mindset of that I'm trying to serve versus just self-interest. And, and, um, and when we get to that stage, that will be great. And so rather than viewing it entirely in stages only, I think if it becomes a mindset that the best way to achieve success is to help others succeed and to add value, to make a difference truly, that that's a mindset we can have right at the outset of our careers. That that truly, that mindset will also help us succeed in the ways that we want to. And we'll achieve both the secondary greatness because we've achieved the primary greatness. So life is about contribution, not accumulation. It's very insightful, Dad, as always. Well, Dad, this has been amazing. I don't think I will ever forget being able to do this podcast here in Montana <laughs> At, at 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 this place and you know i felt like uh i felt like papa was here and um yeah it's just 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 amazing so we have a we have a running joke in the family and i'll share this sorry to embarrass my brother we have a running joke in the family that you know when when uh when we were young my one of my brothers told my dad you know dad you're you're probably the ninth best dad in the world you know just just as like a 6 or 7 year old just said it <laughs> just so it's something we always te- tease you about but I would say that you are you are the best dad in the world, and so so grateful for you, and and grateful that you're on this podcast, but more for your example, and um, just how you have both trusted and inspired me in my own life. So, thanks, son. I so appreciate that coming from you, and um, I think you're an amazing son. I'm so proud of you, and I think what your contribution you're making with this podcast, you know, paradigm shifting books. That would be valuable to anyone as they start their career. I think this is an extraordinary contribution you are making to the world and to people everywhere to help them one by one. And I really love and admire you and respect you and and just feel such love and affection, caring, compassion um, for you, for for Emily, for your children, and um, and just truly honored to be here with you. And what a place! I don't know if you can fully see this. But uh, it's, it's, I'm reminded of the John Steinbeck quote. He said, I love Montana. <laughs> I feel the same, don't you? Yeah. I love Montana. He says, for other states, I feel respect, appreciation, even some affection. But for Montana, it is love. And here we are at this beautiful family gathering place. 
that's been through the generations a gathering place and that that our that your grandfather my dad papa loved so much his dad loved so much and here you and I two other Stephen Coveys with another Stephen Covey your son right there in the house in the cabin to be here with you on your um great podcast is a real treat for me something I'll never forget so Thank you so much. I love you, son. Love you too.